Let's pray. How could we sing such words? Words of guarantees, words of promises. We are finite creatures who cannot predict the future, certainly cannot determine the future, and yet we sing with boldness. We will be home at last. We will sing and we will bow and we will worship. Not because we can secure that future by ourselves, but, oh Lord, because you, by your grace, have secured it for us. And were it left up to us, we would depart, we would run away, we would fail, we would break our promise to you. But you, O oh God, will never break your promises to us because you are faithful. And you never change. And it is on the basis of your own character and your own word and your own gracious commitments to us that we can stand and sing such words. We long for the day when all of these will culminate in our being in your presence with no more sin, no more death, no more fight. Until that day, God, let us be faithful to you, loyal to you, clinging to your promises by faith. And we pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 11. And we're continuing what we began last week. This is part two of a message titled, Can You Break God's Promises? And we live in a world of broken promises. You've broken yours. You've been the victim of other people breaking their promises. But the question for the Christian is, can I break God's promises? Is there something I could do, some sin I could commit that would cancel God's gracious commitments to all those who are truly in Christ? And the answer to that, of course, is no. We're looking at that in two parts. First part last week, the answer was no. The second part this week is no. And we're going to continue our look at God's commitment to keeping his promises Specifically, his promises to Israel, which have a bearing on our lives, given everything that God has promised to us in the book of Romans up to this point. If God doesn't keep his promises to Israel, Paul is arguing, then you and I should doubt God's word and not trust his promises to us. But God does keep his promises to his people, and so we can bank on his promises even to us. Now, you know, King David was a man after God's heart. He was a sinner, but he was a sinner saved by grace, and he loved the one true God. And his reign as king over Israel marked the ascension of Israel to the status of world power. In fact, under David's reign and his son Solomon, we refer to Israel's history in that time as the golden age of Israel. And that golden era quickly gave way to a divided nation, to civil wars, to rampant idolatry, ultimately leading to exile, and then a fledgling return to the land, but under the oppression of a series of Gentile empires, spiritual bankruptcy of the people of Israel at the time of Messiah's arrival, the rejection and the murder of Christ, their own Messiah, followed by the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in A.D. 70, and the scattering of the Jews from one end of the globe to the other. We see in the nation of Israel a history of apostasy at the national level. Meanwhile, the outstanding promises of God for Israel remain. A promise of return to the land with national sovereignty. A national fidelity to Yahweh. The centrality of Jerusalem as the world capital and the center of the worship of God. A new and improved golden age of peace and prosperity that would never end the reign of the Davidic king over all the earth, long life, world peace, the end of animal predation, and a nation of Jews with new hearts who love God, who love their Messiah, who boast in Yahweh before the watching world. These are still outstanding promises of God in our Bible that have yet to come to fruition. And they stand concurrent with the present state of the apostasy of 
the spiritual bankruptcy of the people to whom these promises were made. This is a problem. This is a problem, in fact, that one of my own heroes, John Owen, in the 1600s, pointed out was so critical, so difficult, that he spent 150 pages making this singular argument. That if 1,600 years are not enough to prove that God is done with Israel, I'm not sure what else could be said. And if you've ever read any John Owen, you know he had a lot else to say. (laughs) In other words, Israel was so far gone in John Owen's mind that surely God was done with her, had replaced her perhaps with the church had given her physical, tangible, geographical, and spiritual promises to another group of people. Today in Israel, according to the Israel Central Bureau of Statistics, the religious affiliation of the Israeli population in 2019 was 74.2% Jewish. And and that sort of makes sense, although the, the religious... Judaism in Israel is broken down into a number of different groups with varying theological perspectives. But it is also 17.8% Muslim, followed by 2% Christian of all kinds of various sorts. A much smaller percentage would be evangelical, gospel-believing Christians. 1.6% Druze. And the remaining 4.4% includes faiths such as Samaritanism and Baha'ism, and irreligious people with no faith. In other words, 98% of the people of Israel reject Israel's Messiah outright. It's a staggering reality. And a statement of the spiritual nature of the present national state of Israel. It's difficult to determine the religious affiliations of ethnic Jews worldwide, but we do have some idea of ethnic Jews in America and what they believe. A 2003 poll found that while 79% of Americans believe in God, only 48% of American Jews believe in God, compared with 79%, 90% for Catholics and Protestants. While 60%, 66% of Americans say they are absolutely certain of God's existence, 24% of American Jews said they were certain of God's existence. 9% of Americans believe there is no God, but 19% of American Jews believe that God does not exist. American Jews as a religious group are the most accepting of evolution, 80% of them believing in evolution. 16% of self-professed born-again Christians believe in evolution. Jews, by the way, in America are overrepresented among Buddhists. Uh, American Buddhism boasts... 30% of all American Buddhists identify as Jewish, while only 2% of Americans are Jewish. These are staggering thoughts about the present spiritual state of ethnic Israel. They are apostate. And apostate in the face of all the privileges, all the promises, and the very words of God given to them. And we must ask, what force wins in the end? The waywardness of Israel or the promises of God? And this is a very real problem for, again, the integrity of God, the integrity of God's word, the believability of his promises. Can the sins of God's people negate his gracious commitments to them? And as we sit here this morning, we ask the same question. Can my sin negate God's gracious commitments to me in the gospel? These are related and important questions. We looked last week at verse 1 and discovered that no, the sins of God's people cannot negate his gracious promises. Number one, that would be impossible, we learn in verse 1. Secondly, Paul himself is proof. Paul was a Jew and a Christian, and he believed the gospel. It took a crisis moment in Paul's life where Christ himself came to Paul in a radical way on the Damascus Road. And in case one repentant Israelite is not enough proof of God's commitment to keep his promises, there is a second response, and that is what we look at this morning in verses 2 through 6. It's the same response as the first. No, 
Sins of people cannot negate God's gracious commitments. But the proof here comes from the doctrine of the remnant. A remnant of faithful Israelites in Elijah's day, first of all, and then a remnant of faithful Israelites in Paul's own day. And Paul begins this part of the argument in verse 2. He says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And what he asked as a question in verse 1, he's, he here makes a declarative statement in verse 2. This is emphatic. Again, he picks up the language of 1 Samuel 2.22, or 12.22 and Psalm 94.14. We looked at those last week. Emphatic statements from the Old Testament that God will not reject his people. He cannot reject his people. And Paul uses that very language to illustrate the point. And he says here, his people, this is a reference to ethnic Israel, whom he foreknew. And we're familiar with this word foreknow. Look back at Romans 8.28. We looked at this a little while ago. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, those called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And all whom he predestined, he also called. All whom he called, he also justified. All whom he justified, he also glorified. And this unbreakable chain of salvation begins with the idea of foreknowledge. And as we learn in Romans chapter 8, foreknowledge is not just the idea of knowing something ahead of time, but actually uh, refers to an intimate knowledge of friends where God has chosen before time to set his love and affection on people. To foreknow in that sense is to forelove. To identify before someone even exists, I'm going to set my attention and my affections on this person. And what is true of individuals in terms of God's grace in Romans 8 is true of Israel as a nation here in chapter 11. God chose beforehand to set his affections on them. And remember, the gracious election of Israel by God is the grace of national election. It does not guarantee the salvation of Ezra, every Israelite who has ever lived. The foreknowledge of Israel is, not national, is national foreknowledge, not necessarily individual foreknowledge. It's not as though God has chosen before time to set his affections on every individual Israelite. Quite the contrary. Paul has been making the argument here in Romans, and he's taken great pains to do this, to say that salvation comes only by grace through faith, not by who your parents are, not by heredity or lineage. In fact, Jew and Gentile are leveled by universal depravity, leveled by sin, and the gospel levels Jew and Gentile as well, so that anybody that gets to heaven gets so only on the basis of God's grace through faith by the love of God. Every successive generation of Abraham's descendants has proven that God has not granted eternal life to every descendant of Abraham. Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, and every generation since. However, God has selected the nation of Israel to be a vehicle for his purposes in the world. And God has graciously rescued, sustained, and preserved Israel, even down to our present day, uniquely in this world, to play a remarkable part in God's plans to put his own glory on display through the judgment of sinners and through the redemption of sinners by grace. Listen to Amos 3.2, an Old Testament prophet. God there reveals, you only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. It's not that God didn't know that other nations would exist. Of course, he knew before time all the nations and every person that would exist within those nations. But God foreknew Israel. That is, he set ahead of time his affections on this nation. God has known Israel uniquely amongst all the nations of the earth. In Romans eleven two, 2, God has foreknown Israel, chose them beforehand for relationship for his purpose. And so the national election of Israel becomes a paradigm for the individual election of believers unto eternal life. Remember that chain in Romans 8, 28 to 30. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to look like Jesus, and he predestined them, he called them, he justified and glorified them. The glorification there is that future reality in a past tense verb, because in God's plan, it's as good as done for the believer in Jesus Christ. 
It is an unbreakable chain from eternity past to eternity future of salvation for those who believe. And you could no more break that unbreakable chain of salvation as an individual than Israel could break the chain of God's gracious promises to her as a nation. As a national ethnic identity, Israel is secure in the plans and purposes of God. Even as you, believer, are secure in the love of God and his purposes for you in Christ. So we look beginning in verse 2 as Israel in Elijah's day is proof that God keeps his promises. Notice how Paul introduces this. He says, or do you not know what the scripture says? This insinuates that Paul's readers should already have the answer to this question. Has God rejected his people? They should already have the answer to this question on the basis of what God has said in the Bible. And Paul appeals to the narrative deal detailed for us in 1 Kings. He describes it here in Romans 11 too as the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel. Now, this is fascinating. The, the word pleads here is the word intercedes. That's why that thing was flashing at me in bright lights. You were waiting for me to say, can you turn that rear projector off? You were actually trying to get my attention. Thank you. Turning off this mic. I get it now. <laughs> I see people's faces looking back at that. Why is that screen blinking? I was trying to ignore it. All right. And where were we? Israel in Elijah's day is proof that God keeps his promises. And, and it says here in Romans 11 that Elijah pleaded with God against Israel. The word to plead here is the word to intercede. It's the same word we came across in Romans 8.26, that the Holy Spirit intercedes on behalf of believers in prayer. And we saw this word again in Romans 8.34, that Jesus Christ in heaven intercedes on behalf of believers on the basis of his atoning work at the cross, right? What is the reason that you're not condemned, Christian? Because the work of Jesus Christ stands in your place, ever pleading in the throne room, the courtroom of heaven, that you have been declared righteous on the basis of Christ's work at the cross. You could never be condemned. And here, the same word intercedes is used by Elijah against Israel. That is, Elijah is going to bat in God's presence, not for Israel, but against her. Why? Why is a prophet of Israel interceding against Israel? Why would God's prophets make appeal to God against Israel to whom God had made gracious promises? Notice what Elijah says, Romans 11, 3. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars. And I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. Four statements. Three out of four of them are correct. And to understand Elijah's mindset, we need to turn to 1 Kings. So put on your seatbelts. We'll start in 1 Kings 8. We're going to take a little bit of a historical survey from 1 Kings 8 up to the scene that Paul describes here so that we understand why is Elijah praying against Israel? Again, think about the history of Israel in Elijah's day. The golden age, the David and Solomon days, the ascension to peace, uh, the ascension to prosperity, uh, no enemies during Solomon's day, has fallen on hard times. It did not last long, and it didn't last long because of idolatry. Remember last week, we looked at, at the end of Romans 10, where Paul quoted Deuteronomy 32, where it said that Israel would go on to provoke God by the not gods. That is, Israel was promised by God that they would go into the land, that because they didn't love him from the heart, they would forsake him, they would imbibe the religions of the land they went into, and they would worship those things which are not gods. And it provoked the one true God to anger. The first Kings gives us the first chapters of the tragic narrative of the downfall of Israel from her golden era 
to the divided nation, to idolatry, to civil wars, leading to exile, a return to the land under the impression of Gentile nations, the spiritual bankruptcy at the time of Messiah's arrival, the murder of Christ, the destruction of the temple, and the scattering of the Jews as we see it today. These are the opening chapters to that narrative which went down through Paul's day, even to our own day for the nation of Israel. And we'll start our story here in 1 Kings chapter 8. This is the dedication of the temple. You remember that David, as a man of war, a man of bloodshed, was not permitted by God to build his temple, but his son Solomon collected all the, all the materials that David had set aside for him and began to build the temple. 1 Kings 8 is the dedication of the temple, and here the king of the world power gets on his knees before the people and says, God is the true king. I've built this little box and the heavens and the highest heavens can't contain you, but you've chosen to be here amongst your people. This is a staggering scene, and, and Solomon is the consummate worshiper of Yahweh in the heyday of Israel's history. Look down at verse 56. Solomon, before the people, says, Blessed be Yahweh, who has given rest to his people Israel. Notice Solomon did not give David credit nor himself credit. He says, according to all that he promised, not one word has failed of all of his good promise, which he promised through Moses, his servant. May Yahweh our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, which he has commanded our fathers. Look down at verse 61. Verse 61. He turns to the people and says, let your heart therefore be wholly devoted to Yahweh our God. Verse 66, then they went to their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that Yahweh had shown to David his servant and to Israel his people. What a remarkable day. Turn to chapter 10. We get a little bit of a glimpse of how God had prospered Israel in this golden era. Verse 14, now the weight of the gold which came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. So one year's input of gold was about 25 tons. That's a lot of gold. Besides that, from the traders and the wares of the merchants and all the kings of the Arabs and the governors of the country. Look down at verse 21, all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold all of them, you know, the sippy cup in your kid's cabinet, that was gold too. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. Your, your cabin dishware, all gold. None was of silver. Silver was considered without value in the days of Solomon. This is remarkable prosperity. Look at verse 22, the king had at sea the ships of Tarshish with the ships of Hiram. Once every three years, the ships of Tarshish came bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. Do you understand that the, the best goods that the world had to offer were brought in by Solomon's navy? This truly was the golden era. Verse 24, all the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom which God had put in his heart. And they brought every man his gift, articles of silver and gold, garments, weapons, spices, horses, mules, so much year by year. The, the treasures were simply incalculable. Turn the page. First Kings 11. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which Yahweh had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them. Okay, Solomon did not only not associate with them, he married them. Nor shall they associate with you. For they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. And Solomon held fast to these wives in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. 
When Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God. Just three chapters earlier, Solomon's heart was fully devoted to the Lord his God. Chapter 11, his heart was not devoted. Solomon went after, verse 5, Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, did not follow Yahweh fully as David his father had done. Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, might be the Mount of Olives, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. You remember what the worship of Molech was characterized by, people offering their firstborn children in the fire on the burning bronze arms of this idol. This is Solomon, David's son, author of much of the wisdom literature in our Bibles. What a tragedy. In chapter 12, you see that Rehoboam's son, or Solomon, Rehoboam, Rehoboam Solomon's son, behaved foolishly. And the nation was divided under Rehoboam so that Jeroboam, a political rival, ruled the northern 10 tribes of Israel while Solomon's son Rehoboam was left with the southern two. And from this point on, right after Solomon's reign, you have the divided nation and the civil wars that followed. And look at chapter 12, verse 26. Jeroboam, not in the line of David, a political rival who took over power and God promised it to him because of Solomon's sin. Jeroboam said in his heart, verse 26, now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So Jeroboam, over the northern ten tribes, recognizes that if worship still happens for all the tribes of Israel down in Jerusalem, if the, if the people go south for those required feasts, if Jerusalem continues to remain the center of Yahweh worship, then people will defect, and people will go back to Rehoboam. And so out of a political motivation to consolidate his power, he sold an idea to the people hey, don't bother going down to Jerusalem. Just stay up here and worship. We'll put altars up here. You can worship Yahweh up here. He even reminded the people of their exodus from Egypt by setting up two golden calves and said, this is your God. Worship him here. And what do we have? A, a, a series of accommodations by the king of Israel. By the way, Israel from this point on refers to the northern 10 tribes while Judah is the reference to the southern two. So while Israel used to be a, a single word for a single nation, now it becomes the reference to a divided nation and the ten northern tribes. So Jeroboam sells convenience of worship to the people. It's, you know, it's a lot of work to get up on a Sunday morning and go to church. Oh, did I say it that way? No, it's a lot of work to go all the way down to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh. That's just too much trouble. We'll make it simple for you. We'll make it convenient. We'll make it easy. And then he contextualized the worship of Yahweh. You know, the, the people around here, uh, up here in the north, they, they worship their gods in certain ways under every green tree and on every high hill. And you know, we can do that too. Oh, it, it can be about Yahweh. You can worship Yahweh on every high hill and under every green tree. But he contextualized worship for the people. You know, the people around us do it that way. We can do it that way too. And listen, the argument could have been made, Solomon did it. And that only invited a downward spiral away from contextualization, further down into syncretism. That is, you know what? You, you can worship both. You can have a foot in the, in the worship of Baal or Chemosh or any of the others. You can have your Asherah poles, and you can worship Yahweh too. 
And eventually this will result in all-out apostasy by the northern ten tribes. So the result of this divided kingdom was a downward spiral for the northern twelve tribes. And it was Jeroboam who got all of this started for the northern tribes. Now look down at 13, 1 Kings 13 and verse 33. Jeroboam had been warned earlier in chapter 13 by God, uh, by a prophet of God. And then Jeroboam had reached out his hand uh, against the altar of God. And when he stretched out his hand, it sort of got frozen in place so he couldn't pull it back. Uh, The text says his hand dried up. And then he asked the prophet, will you please ask God to heal my hand? Which is an interesting acknowledgement for the one running away from Yahweh, knowing that only Yahweh can heal me. He appeals to the prophet and Yahweh graciously heals him. He doesn't heed the warning. He doesn't soften his heart as the result of God's grace. 1 Kings 13, 33. After this event, Jeroboam did not return from his evil way, but again he made priests of the high places from among all the people. Any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. Uh, Remember that in Israel, only the Levites were supposed to be priests. He said, anybody can be a priest. We can worship anywhere we want. We can worship any way we want. He didn't turn. Look down at chapter 14, verse 7. The message came to Ahijah the prophet. Go say to Jeroboam, thus says Yahweh God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel, and I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, Yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do only that which was right in my sight. And you have done more evil than all who were before you, and you have gone and made for yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and you have cast me behind your back. This is a fulfillment of what Moses said in Deuteronomy 32 that Israel would choose non gods to worship and would provoke the one true God. Look down at verse 15, 1 Kings 14, verse 15. Yahweh will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he will uproot Israel from this good land that he gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River because they have made their Asherim, provoking the Lord to anger. This is a judgment against Israel. And then look at verse 16. He will give up Israel on account of the sins of Jeroboam, which he committed and with which he made Israel to sin. Jeroboam gets credit for bringing all of the nation of Israel, the northern ten tribes, into an idolatry from which they never turned. In fact, from this point forward, Israel is a reference to those northern ten tribes only and Judah to the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And in the history of Judah following this, There is a back and forth. There are good kings and there are bad kings. But in Israel, in the northern ten tribes, there are only bad kings. In Judah, the Davidic line continues, which, by the way, is such a gracious reminder of the promise of God, 2 Samuel 7, that Messiah would come and reign from David's line. And two points in the Davidic line, the Davidic line gets boiled down to one male And yet God miraculously preserves the Davidic line, and the Davidic kings of Judah continue the line. Meanwhile, in Israel, you have a series of violent exchanges of power, conspiracies, assassinations, the annihilations of entire family lines, and revolutions. In the southern two tribes, in Judah, you have this phrase of each successive king. Either he walked as his father David and worshiped Yahweh, or he walked in the sins of his father or fathers, meaning he followed his dad or his grandpa or his great-grandpa in rejecting Yahweh. In Judah, a king either walked according to David or he walked according to the sins of his fathers. But in Israel, it was said of each successive king, he walked in the way of Jeroboam. So you have these two heads over the tribes, (laughs) David and Jeroboam. David was a mark of fidelity to Yahweh, and Jeroboam became the symbol 
for rejection of Yahweh and the pursuit of idolatry. Nadab in chapter 15, Basha in 15, Zimri in chapter 16. And if you fast forward all the way to the end of 1 Kings in 2252, it says this, the king did evil in the sight of Yahweh and walked in the way of his father, in the way of his mother, in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. And the same thing picks up in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Kings 3, Jehoram, the son of Ahab, does the same thing, walks in the sins of Jeroboam. In other words, all of Israel's subsequent idolatry traces all the way back to this one king who started off compromising and then syncretizing, leading to apostasy. In chapter 16 of 1 Kings, we come across Omri, not our Omri. Our Omri's good. <laughs> this Omri, 1 Kings 16, verse 24. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver, and he built on the hill, and he named the city which he built Samaria after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill. So this is where Samaria begins, and it becomes the religious capital for the northern 12 tribes. This is why you get to the Samaritans in the New Testament and the Samaritan woman. They're seen by Israel and the people of Judea as compromisers. This is where it begins. They compromised with the pagan nations around them, and Samaria was the capital. Verse 25, Omri did evil in the sight of Yahweh, and he acted more wickedly than all who were before him. Think about that. All the evil of all the lines of people who had followed Jeroboam before Omri, and Omri is said to be the worst ever. Look down at chapter 16, verse 30. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of Yahweh more than all who were before him. Right? Ahab was worse than Omri, who was worse than everyone before him. Verse 31, it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for Ahab to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went to serve Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke Yahweh, God of Israel, than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now, what Ahab did was probably a matter of political expediency to form an alliance with the Sidonians, the Phoenicians. He marries the king's daughter. And the king of the Sidonians, Ethbaal, you hear the word Baal in his name, he was a worshiper of Baal. He was also high priest of the religion. King of the land, high priest of the religion. His daughter is Jezebel. And Ahab married Jezebel to form this alliance with the Phoenicians. And Ahab and Jezebel together wanted to make the ten tribes of Israel come underneath the Phoenician religion to form a political and powerful alliance. The word Baal is, is simply a Semitic word, a Hebrew word for Lord. It used to be a good word. You know, sometimes you meet somebody uh, with a certain name and that produces a bad association, and then after that, you, you really don't want to call anybody that name anymore. Uh, Baal was like that. It was a title for Lord, and, and sometimes in the Bible, it's used to describe Yahweh himself, the one true God. He is the Lord. It just means he's in charge. But Baal became a, a name and title for the male deity of the Phoenicians, the Sidonians. And he was the god of the storm. That is, he was the god responsible for bringing rain. And, and what's important about that is in an, agri an agrarian society, rain is critical to the provision of crops. It would be appropriate to see Baal as the god of materialism. If I worship God, if, if I worship Baal, the god of the storm who provides the rain, who provides my crops, who gives me everything that I need, if I do what he wants, then I'll get stuff. Right? And that's the heart of idolatry. It really is the worship of me through whatever vehicle I need to do that is set up as a God to worship. It's all about what do I get for myself? And if Baal is the one who brings rain, then I'm going to do whatever he wants so that I can have my stuff. And Baal's co cohort in the Sidonian religion was Asherah, a female de deity. She was his cohort. <laughs> 
and the worship of Baal and Asherah together was a highly charged, perverted, openly flaunted sexual immorality. The reason the worship of Asherah and Baal was done under every green tree and on every high hill was so that it could be seen everywhere. It was a voyeuristic perversion of worship that involved brutal and bloody sacrifice, a satanic perversion of Israel's God-ordained sacrificial system, and it, sometimes it included human sacrifice. And the whole idea of doing this worship that involved prostitutional priests, priestesses, the whole reason for doing this on the high places was so that it could be closer to the gods so that they could voyeuristically observe the violence and the immorality. It was brutal, ugly, immoral. It was so bad that after the introduction of Baal religion by Ahab and Jezebel, that word Baal gets dropped in any positive sense in the Hebrew language. In fact, the Hebrews replaced the word Baal with the word shame. And when they would talk about Israel's worship of Baal, they would just call it Israel's shame. They wouldn't even say the word anymore. In, verse, or in chapter 17 of 1 Kings, we get the Elijah interlude. Here, Elijah comes onto the scene. We've been going from king to king to king to king to king, and then a huge stop in the story, and we're introduced to Elijah. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, as Yahweh, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall neither be dew nor rain these years except by my word. In other words, God was going to do something through Elijah that actually fulfilled the cursings laid out by Moses in Deuteronomy. If you don't follow the Lord, then you're not going to get rain. Now, this is ironic because Baal is supposedly the God of rain. What is Elijah doing? What is God doing through his prophet? Shutting up the heavens. Who's Lord? Who's really in charge? And so Elijah predicts drought. And then he goes to Sidon. Okay, if we go back to 1 Kings 8, Solomon married Sidonian women, and Jezebel was from Sidon. Do you understand the infiltration of Sidonian idolatry was incipient in Solomon's day, and then full-fledged the government-endorsed religion in Jeroboam's day. And God sends Elijah where? To Sidon, to, to the heart of this whole thing, it, to the place where Ahab got Jezebel from and where the religion of Baal came from. And God sends him to a widow of that land. She's a Gentile, and she's in the land of Baal worship of the Sidonians, and God does amazing things through Elijah, provides provision for himself and for the widow and her family. He heals her son, raises, raises him from the dead. And then in 1 Kings 17, you have indications of her actually ascribing truth to Yahweh. She calls him the, the, the living God, the God of Israel in verse 12. And then she expresses faith in Yahweh, the God of Israel in verse 24 of 1 Kings 17. And then in 1 Kings 18, you have this pivotal scene at Mount Carmel. 1 Kings 18, 4, Jezebel is said to have killed the prophets of Yahweh. This is pretty serious religion. When the, when the government sets up its own religion and then goes after all the adherents of other religions, this is serious. These are dark days. Look down at verse 17 of 1 Kings 18. When Ahab saw Elijah... Ahab said to him, is this you, you troubler of Israel? Why did the king think Elijah was the troubler of Israel? Because it wasn't raining. That should be clue number one, that I'm worshiping the wrong God. That was not Ahab's response. He said, I, Elijah responded to him, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have because you have forsaken the commandment of Yahweh and you have followed the Baals. Verse 19, now then send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel together 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Think about that. 950 idolatrous prophets and priests and priestesses on the government dole. They're on the government payroll. That's what it means when it says they eat at Jezebel's table. The government provides their living. Nearly a thousand of them and one Elijah. 
meet me at Mount Carmel. I call you out. And they do. And we have the showdown in the second half of chapter 18. Verse 22, Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of Yahweh, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And so he gives them the charge and they build the altar and he challenges the prophets of Baal to have Baal come down and take up the altar by fire. Look at verse 26. They took the ox which was given them and they prepared it and they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. They're dancing. They're carrying on with their uh, religious activities. And it came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he's occupied or gone aside. Probably a reference to your god is in the bathroom. (laughs) Or maybe he's on a journey. Or perhaps he is asleep and he needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and they cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. What a gruesome, bloody, awful scene and futile. When midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Listen, probably going delirious from loss of blood, probably in a uh, semi-conscious state, highly suggestible state due to their dancing and leaping and bleeding and all that they're doing. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. What a scene. Then Elijah said, verse 30, to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of Yahweh, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of Yahweh had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Isn't that interesting? Israel means he wrestles with God. You you belong to Yahweh, the one true God. You're not the nation of the Baals. And Elijah unites with 12 stones what the sins of the nation had divided into 10 and 2. And here's the showdown. So with the stones, he built an altar, verse 32, in the name of Yahweh. He made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. He arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time and a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar and also filled the trench with water. What could possibly set this on fire? At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Yahweh, answer me. Verse 38, then the fire of Yahweh fell, consumed the burnt offering of the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they say, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. And then Elijah had all the prophets of Baal seized and killed. Remarkable scene. It culminates in verse 45. In a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy shower. Baal, the God of rain, is nothing. Yahweh is the one true God. Then the hand of Yahweh was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he outran Ahab to Jezreel. Uh, The geography, a little bit debatable, something like a marathon, 17 to 30 miles or so. Why is Elijah running to where Jezebel is to meet Ahab and Jezebel there? I think he thinks we won. We've won the hearts of the people. And then what happens? Chapter 19. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. She found out that Elijah had all the prophets of Baal killed and she said, you're dead. This didn't go like Elijah thought. So he's afraid, verse 3, and he runs for his life. Verse four, he asks that he might die. He prays to God that God would just take his life. 
And then he goes on a 40-day, 40-night journey to Horeb, Mount Horeb. That is Mount Sinai. What happened to Mount Sinai? That's where the nation of Israel was constituted. They got their constitution there. That's where God gave them the law. Elijah is going back to the beginning. I believe Elijah here is not necessarily running away, although he, he did that. But I believe God commissioned him. The angel of the Lord came to Elijah. By the way, the angel of the Lord is Yahweh himself in person, probably a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ, came and cared for Elijah and then sent him on a journey where? To Sinai. So that he could revisit the beginning. What does Elijah say? Verse 10. I have been very zealous for Yahweh, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they're seeking my life as well. God asks Elijah, what are you doing here? After he had sent him there. And invites Elijah to express what is on his heart. And this benefits us tremendously. <laughs> Think about this. Elijah was not actually alone. Earlier in the narrative, we skipped over it, but he had met Obadiah, another prophet of the Lord who feared Yahweh from his youth. And when Jezebel went on her terror reign and killed the prophets of Israel, Obadiah hid prophets at great peril to himself, 50 at a time in caves. Elijah knew that. He even met with Obadiah. He knew about the hundred hidden prophets. When you go back to 1 Kings 18, 22, when Elijah's on Mount Carmel and he says, I alone am left a prophet of Yahweh. <laughs> He's probably referring to the fact that he alone, he feels alone, standing alone against all the prophets of Baal, singularly representing Yahweh. But you have to understand something. Elijah was not alone. Elijah was never alone. Elijah wasn't alone because the God of Israel was faithful to him and because the God of Israel was faithful to Israel, right? We, we, we can talk about the Elijah syndrome, the one man against the world, contra mundum, and, and we might think of men like Athanasius and Luther, who in church history stood alone against the world to hold on to the truth and be faithful to God. You need to remember that Athanasius wasn't alone at the Council of Nicaea defending the deity of Christ, and Martin Luther was not alone in the Reformation. There were those before him and those alongside him who held on to the truth of God. Elijah needed to learn this lesson. And think about this. Elijah was famous for this Mount Carmel cataclysmic moment. When God meets him in a hole in a rock on Mount Sinai, and, and, and God comes shattering rocks with a violent wind, and then there's an earthquake tearing rocks down, and then God manifests himself how? In a quiet wind. That's not a reference in how God speaks to Christians, by the way. <laughs> that is a reminder to Elijah that the predominance of God's work is not in the big, cataclysmic, Mount Carmel, me against the world events, but in God's gracious, kind, often invisible, working through faithful people. What does God say to Elijah? And Paul quotes this here in Romans 11. What is the divine response to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 in Israel, in the northern tribes, who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Staggering number for a prophet of God who thought he was all alone. What is the lesson for Elijah? God keeps a remnant because he keeps his promises. And he's going to do what he said. And, and Paul appeals to this very scene and these very words of God to, to a, a, a lonely, frightened prophet to remind us this truth. You think Israel's spiritual state is bad in Paul's day. Well, look, it was bad in Elijah's day. And God, notice the language, kept for himself faithful people. 7,000 faithful men. That probably includes many other women and children. God kept a remnant. So Paul quotes 1 Kings 19 and Romans 11 to demonstrate that as bad as it might look for Israel in Paul's day, this was nothing new and God would still be 
faithful. By the way, when Baal is referred to in the New Testament, in the Greek language, a feminine definite article is used. Baal was a male deity. But the Hebrew word for shame, remember this is a testimony, a monument of Israel's shame and rejecting the one true God, is a feminine word. Paul brings that over in the New Testament too. Kind of poking his finger at Baal, you're nothing. And saying it's a matter of shame and rejection by unfaithful people. Three-fourths of Elijah's statements were true. They were trying to kill him. But he wasn't alone. The altars had been torn down, but he wasn't alone. The prophets of God had been killed, but he wasn't alone. You know how God did not comfort Elijah? Don't worry about it, Elijah. Um, You might be alone, but you're not actually going to die. You're going to get raptured before the rapture, the chariot and the fire and all that stuff. You don't actually have to physically die. He didn't bring any of that up to Elijah, didn't comfort him with that truth, which was part of God's plan. He comforts him with the truth of God's faithfulness to his people. And what a comfort that should be for us. God keeps himself a remnant. And what was true in Elijah's day is true in Paul's day. Back to Romans 11. Look at verse 5. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. A remnant. That is a spiritually alive subset of ethnic Israel that God has kept faithful to himself by grace, by God's gracious choice, by the grace of election, by love. God has sought to set his love on people and kept them for himself. Paul was an example, but it wasn't just Paul. In fact, most believers in the first generation of the church were Jewish. Paul gives testimony to this and he says, many of the Pharisees have come to believe in Messiah. And now that the gospel has gone to the Gentiles, in each generation there have been Jews who have believed the gospel. There is a remnant of Israel today. Some of you in this room of ethnic Jewish descent who believe in Jesus Christ. A 2013 Pew Research poll found that 1.7 million American Jewish adults, 1.6 million of them who were raised in Jewish homes, identify as Christians today and still consider themselves ethnically Jewish. There's an assurance for us in the doctrine of the remnant that God is not done with Israel and that he will keep his promises. That argument culminates at the end of chapter 11 in that fully, one day, Israel will repent en masse and believe the gospel. We'll get there. What are some takeaways for us as Christians today in the church in the 21st century? Well, just know this. The gospel is not all about me. Gospel is not all about you. The gospel is not all about Gentiles in the church age. God is up to something bigger than us. In fact, there will be humbled Jews in heaven, just as there are to be humbled Gentiles in heaven. This is all about the humbling of man and the exalting of the grace of God for the glory of God in saving undeserving sinners. That's where Romans 11 is going. That's why the doxology, the song, the outburst of praise at at the end of Romans 11 exists. Because God brings Israel repentant to a place where they say, I don't deserve to be in God's family. And it ought to remind us Gentiles what we should be have been saying all along. I don't deserve to be in God's family. We don't take God's grace for granted. There's another takeaway for us in this. The glory of God is manifested in the salvation of the undeserving. Israel didn't deserve to have God's favor nationally guaranteed to them, and you and I don't deserve to have God's favor bestowed on us as individuals. Another takeaway for us is a reminder that Paul had, a reminder that Elijah should have known, Christian, You are not alone. You might feel alone in your family. You might feel alone at school. 
You might feel alone in your workplace. We collectively might start to feel more and more alone in our culture. But you have to remember the doctrine of the remnant. God keeps his own for himself, and he's faithful to do it. No matter what the days look like, no matter how many high places there are with idolatrous worship, it doesn't matter if the whole world has gone after sexual immorality and materialism in the worship of self, God keeps his people. And there's a last takeaway. God's promises win. Your sin, Christian, if you are in Christ, is no match for God's gracious commitment to your eternal good, to your looking like Christ, to your benefiting from all of God's promises. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and there is no separation from his love. You can bank on these things because God is God, and he keeps his promises. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Oh, how we need it. Oh, how we need to know what you have said. Great and glorious things about your grace. These are not truths about ourselves. This is not grace plus our works. Otherwise, it's no longer grace. But so that you might demonstrate once again that you are kind and loving to the infinite degree to the undeserving. Our security in your love is all of you, all of grace. It is your great name we praise for these things.